Hi, my name is Mitch, and today we're going to be moving on to our 10th presidential biography. And that, of course, is our 10th president, John Tyler. So, John Tyler Jr. was born on March 29, 1790, at his family's plantation, which was called Greenway, and is in present day Charles City County, Virginia, um, which is actually very close to the same county, actually where William Henry Harrison was born, um, who was our last presidential biography. Um, and of course, he's gonna be mentioned in this one as well. Um, his parents were, of course, named John Sr. and his mother's name was Mary. Now, John Sr. was a prominent Virginia politician. Um, he was the governor of Virginia, I believe, um, at one point. Um, he was also a prominent planter. Um, thus, because their family was very prestigious, John Jr. attended some very notable schools um, in the local area in Charles City County. Um, and this was before he entered into the College of William and Mary in 1805. Now, at just age 17, he graduated from William and Mary and studied law with his father and was later admitted to the Virginia Bar in 1809. Um, upon his uh, father's election as governor, as we mentioned before, um, he mo moved to Richmond um and john jr joined the uh joined a law practice um which was actually headed by the former attorney general edmund randolph who i believe served in the original cabinet under george washington in 1811 uh john jr was first elected or was elected to his first political office which was the virginia house of delegates at the age of just 21. um and as if you watched the other other parts of these videos you will have known that Many of the early presidents served in the Virginia House of Delegates. Um, so it was, uh, it, it set him on track to be a, uh, to continue his family's line and be, continue being a prominent Virginia politician. Um, two years after he joined the House of Delegates, his, uh, John, John Sr. died. Um, and as John Jr. was the oldest son, he inherited his vast amounts of property and wealth. Um, okay, so soon after entering the House of Delegates, John Tyler began to court Letitia Christian, who was another member, prominent member of Virginia High Society. In 1813, they were married and they had eight children together. So bear with me. You know, if you watch the other ones of these videos, you'll know we, I do like to go over all of the president's children. Um, so I'm going to briefly mention them all here. John Tyler did have the most children out of any president. Um, having eight or uh, 15 in all. Um, so, all right, let's go through them briefly. So with Letitia, his first wife, he had Mary, uh, Robert. Robert served in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. John Jr., who was actually John III, technically, um, who uh, served in the Mexican-American War and also in the Civil War with his brother. Um, Letitia Christian, uh, also served as the acting first lady in between his father's uh, marriages. Um, there was Elizabeth, there was Anne, who unfortunately died in infancy. There was Alice, and there was Tazewell, who uh, would later become a doctor. Uh, unfortunately, Letitia died in 1842 from a stroke, and this was while John Tyler was president. Um, so as a result, uh, John began courting a girl or a woman named Julia Gardner, who was actually 30 years younger than him. Um, and once they were married in 1844, it, it, um, their marriage became the largest age gap between a president and his wife. The, um, the runner up for that is actually Grover Cleveland um, and his second wife, who I believe was 28 years younger than him, something like that. But John Tyler, being 30 years older than his second wife, Julia, um, is naturally the largest age gap between a president and his first lady. Um, but together, they had seven children. Um, so uh, I'm going to briefly go over their children as well. Uh, there was David, who also became a soldier and a congressman. John Alexander. Uh, Julia Gardner. Um, uh, Lachlan Gardner, who became a doctor as well, like his uh, half brother Tazewell. Um, Leon Gardner, who became president of the College of William Mary, 
and actually still has a living son named Robert Fitz Fitzwalter. Um, and um, or not not Robert Fitzwalter. Robert Fitzwalter was John Tyler's son, but um, but Lyon has an actual living son, meaning that John Tyler, who was born in 1790, has one living grandson. And this is because John was born, uh, or John was married, like we mentioned, John Tyler was married a second time and his wife was much younger than him. So we had a child, um, what I believe around the age of 60 or 65, something like that. And then his son, Lion, had a son about the same age. So, so um, that's 120 years if you look at it that way. And so 120 years after John Tyler was born, his um, his surviving grandson was born. So his grandson is still alive today. Uh, one of his grandsons is still alive today. Um, he also had Robert Fitzwalter, like I mentioned, who became a farmer, and Margaret Pearl. Uh, moving on, though. Uh, during the War of 1812, John Tyler led a militia, com a militia company, but he never actually fought himself during the war. Um, nonetheless, in 1816, he was elected to the House of Representatives, joining the federal government for the first time, and there he would serve for almost five years. Um, he became a member of the Democratic Republican Party, and being from the South, he heavily opposed Federalist ideas and ardently supporters, uh, supported things like states' rights and, um, and federalism. Um, and uh, that this was mainly because he did own slaves himself and was opposed uh, heavily to any congressional act to limit it. He believed that it was very much a state's issue. Um, in 1821, he left the House and returned to the House of Delegates um, and began practicing law again. Four years after that, the state legislature elected him the governor of Virginia a post his father had served um, before him. Um, in 1824, John Tyler, uh, as governor of the state, uh, openly supported Secretary of State John Quincy Adams' candidacy for president. Um, and this was because, well, they were kind of in the era of good feelings at this time, so everyone was a Democratic Republican. Um, Tyler came to despise Andrew Jackson, believing he was... Um, well, as Tyler was very much a state's right um, supporter, Jackson was not. He was very much, he very much supported federalism um, in, a, in, in some ways, in some other ways not. But, um, but the two became, or Tyler really came to hate Andrew Jackson, and thus um, he supported John Quincy Adams in 1824. In 1827, three years after that, he became a senator, um, and he left the Adams camp after that. Um, and wholeheartedly threw himself in advocacy of states' rights. So when the nullification crisis took hold during Jackson's administration, Tyler strongly supported South Carolina's appeal to nullify, uh, to be able to nullify acts that states felt were um, unconstitutional. Um, and thus, um, and thus in, in the nullification crisis, they were, South Carolina was opposing the tariff, the so-called tariff of abominations, or the tariff of 1828, um, which um, was a federal tariff put on put on the states in South Carolina. Thought that it put, or really John John C. Calhoun, the vice president, believed that it put an unreasonable burden on South Carolina, and thus they had the right to nullify it. And Tyler agreed with this theory of nullification, thus opposing Jackson on almost every issue. He became a leading member of the anti-Jackson force in Congress, though he was still technically, though he was still really a Democrat at heart. He, although Jackson was a Democrat himself, he still, um, he still opposed Jackson, even though they were of the same party. And he kind of stylized the president as King Andrew because um, he thought Jackson was um, taking the Constitution into his own hands. Um, and styling himself as a monarch, um, and thus M Tyler and many of the anti-Jackson forces in Congress style stylized Jackson as um, as as King Andrew, um, and thus because he opposed Jackson so much, but because Jackson came to dominate the Democratic Party, he ended up joining the Whig Party, which emerged from John Quincy Adams' National Republican Party. 
though he really didn't agree with any of the Whig platform, but he still joined the party um, because he really just wanted to oppose Andrew Jackson. Um, so, in 1835, still in the Senate, Tyler briefly served as the president pro tempore. Um, and he is still the only president to this day to also serve as pres to serve as also president pro tempore of the Senate. If you don't know what the president pro tempore of the Senate is today, there um, today it's the um, the most senior um, member of, of of the party and of the majority party in the Senate. So right now, until January third, twenty twenty three, it's Patrick Leahy. Um, a senator from Vermont, been in the Senate for like 55 years, something like that. Um, and he's the most senior Democrat in Congress or, or in the Senate. So he is the um, president pro tempore now. And basically the president pro tempore is kind of like second in command of the, of the Senate. So we have the vice president who's technically the figurehead of the Senate and the president pro tempore is right below him. So Jackson, back then in, in the 1830s, the president pro tempore was not necessarily the most senior member of the Senate. So Jackson, or, or sorry, Tyler was um, elected the president pro tempore in 1835 and briefly served that office. But the following year, he resigned and returned to his law practice. Um, and however, as a former Democrat, he could draw some supporters. And in 1836, he was uh, put on two of the three Whig presidential tickets as a running mate, because in 1836, the Whigs ran three different candidates, um, hoping that they could all draw regional support and thus take the majority away from the Democratic candidate, Martin Van Buren. Now, Tyler, being a, de a former Democrat, could not be put on the top of the ticket, but he could be a running mate, and he would thus attract some Democratic voters who didn't like Andrew Jackson. Um, and thus, they were hoping that some of the Democratic voters would turn to support the Whigs instead. Now, this strategy didn't work, um, and the Democratic Martin Van Buren ended up winning the election. Um, but how, his handling of the economic crisis that began during his term turned many voters away. If you watch the Martin Van Buren video, or the Andrew Jackson one, you will, we, will, we, we did mention the Panic of 1837. Um, and even actually in the last video we did as well with William Henry Harrison. The massive disaster that ruined Martin Van Buren's presidency. And in 1840, Tyler was again put on the Whig ticket as William Henry Harrison's running mate. Um, and this was again a strategy to pull, pull some Democrats away from the, um, from the Democratic Party and support the Whigs instead. Now, the Harrison-Tyler ticket, championed as Tippecanoe and Tyler II, as Harrison's nickname was Tippecanoe, um, and if you watched the last video, I do explain why his nickname is Tippecanoe, um, but in this, this Harrison-Tyler ticket becomes, um, it, it wins the election of 1840 uh, because, again, of Martin Van Buren's um, handling of the economic crisis. And thus, Tyler became the 10th vice president of the United States on March 4th, 1841. However, if you did watch the last video, you will have seen that Harrison dies just 32 days into his presidency because he didn't wear a jacket on his day of his inauguration. He made the longest inaugural address in history. It was a cold and somewhat rainy day. Um, and thus, he was out speaking for almost two hours. Um, I believe, and this um, and this coupled with him getting caught in a rainstorm later that day resulted in him uh, catching pneumonia, and his doctors failed to heal him. And just 32 days into his presidency, Harrison dies of uh, of pneumonia. And thus, on April 6th, Tyler is sworn in as the 10th president of the United States. Now, Tyler is the first person to become president because his predecessor died. So um, he's the first person to execute the role of the vice president to survive and to become president should the vice president, or should the president die. Now, this was all new. Uh, the country, was, or the, the, this government under the constitution had been in place for over 50 years at this point, and this had never happened. So we didn't have someone like Washington setting the precedents now. So what, 
was to happen was going to be very controversial and very tricky. What Tyler had to do was to make people respect him as the president, as the true president, because many people argued that he was only the acting president. Um, and thus, this was um, very, this came about as a result of a conflict with the Whigs. Now, Tyler was not a true Whig, but he was running as the Whig, um, or he was, he ran as the Whig vice presidential candidate. So technically, at this point, he was a Whig. Um, and thus, he found himself at odds with the party leadership, um, especially the one of the most prominent senators or, or, or lawmakers in the country, the senator from Kentucky, Henry Clay. And Clay very much opposed Tyler's presidency. Clay had run for president, I believe, twice before this already. So he was not about to let um, someone like Tyler, uh, who was not a true Whig, become the leader of the party. Thus, many called Tyler his accidency and claimed that he was the only acting president, or he, that he was only the acting president and was not the full, or was not the president with the full powers like Harrison was before him. However, Tyler declared that he was the full president, as much as the nine holders of the office before him. He, 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 he thought he argued that the, the, the Constitution gave him the full powers of the presidency. Even though he wasn't elected to the presidency, the people did elect him the vice president. And because of the um, processes put out in the Constitution, he argued he should be recognized as the full president. Because of Tyler's precedent, because of this argument, Eight other vice presidents who face similar situations since then have been respected as the full president. Um, but still, now, even though he argued and constantly, um, it was constantly purporting that he was the full president, he continued to clash with Clay um, and the rest of that wing. And throughout his entire presidency, um, and he found conflict with them throughout his entire presidency. He even vetoed two Whig bills to charter a third National Bank of the United States. So he was not doing anything to help his image with the Whig party. Now, to protest Tyler, his entire cabinet, except for the Secretary of State, who I believe was Daniel Webster at the time, Daniel Webster put his country over his party, and thus he stayed on. But the rest of the cabinet resigned, and upon his vetoing of, an, of another tariff bill, the first presidential impeachment resolution was presented to the House of Representatives. However, the impeachment um, resolution doesn't go anywhere, and he doesn't, he's, not, um, he's not impeached. That, uh, the first president to be impeached would be Andrew Johnson, but he does face the first impeachment resolution of any president. Um, now, throughout Tyler's entire presidency, the Texas question pers persisted, um, and this was because the United States continued to expand west. Now, Tyler supported the annexation of Texas, and his new Secretary of State, John Calhoun, who was the former vice president, negotiated a treaty which would see Texas join the Union, but it would permanently allow slavery. As this would upset the balance of free and slave states created by the Missouri Compromise, the Senate quickly rejected Calhoun's treaty. They weren't about to reopen the debate just to allow Texas into the, uh, just to annex Texas. However, in 1844, the Democratic candidate James Polk is elected president to replace Tyler, and he champions westward expansion and the idea of manifest destiny, which we're going to get into more in the next video. Thus, Congress finally agrees to admit Texas to the Union as they see that because Polk was elected and he championed westward expansion, the people naturally also championed westward expansion. So they agree to admit Texas to the Union um, a few days or actually the um, the charter or the, the resolution to admit Texas to the Union is signed just three days before Tyler leaves office. And thus Texas is just admitted, is admitted to the Union or admitted to, or is annexed by the United States just before Tyler leaves office in 1845.
Now, some other events in John Tyler's presidency. One new state was admitted to the Union during Tyler's term in office. This was Florida in 1845. He also appointed one Supreme Court justice. This was Samuel Nelson, also in 1845. The president also nearly died during his presidency. Um, this is some, an event that doesn't get as much attention as really it probably should. But while he was aboard the USS Princeton, um, while he was touring this boat um, in Maryland, I believe. I believe it's in Maryland. Um, but while he, was, while he was touring this boat, a cannon exploded in 1844. As a result of this accident, two members of Tyler's cabinet are killed. This is in addition to his future wife, Julia's father, passing away along the boat uh, or passing away during the explosion. And Tyler was very nearly killed in the explosion. It's partly because of the explosion that Julia marries Tyler um, because she had lost her father. She saw Tyler as being um, or as kind of someone who could help her in this uh, the hard, in the hard time in that hard time, of course. Um, but anyway, never truly being a Whig, uh, Tyler does not win the nomination of either political party in 1844. He could really have run for either. He was really a Democrat at heart, but he had run his, he had been in, in uh, sorry, he had been throughout his entire presidency a, technically a Whig. So he could have run on either party, but he did not. He was not very popular. He didn't really have a good shot at either. So he retires in 1845, um, and he retires back to his Sherwood Forest Plantation, which is back in Charles City County, where he was born. Though he strongly believed in states' rights throughout his entire lifetime, um, he did what he could to avoid the Civil War, but no one at the time, no one at all, not even Martin Van Buren who tried, not Tyler who tried, could avoid the Civil War could stop, could do anything to stop the Civil War from happening. So naturally, as we all know, he was pretty unsuccessful in that weak, very weak endeavor. And after the South succession, he's actually elected to the Confederate um, House of Representatives. So many people see him as a, as a real traitor to the country. I mean, he, um, he's the only president to be elected to the Confederate government. Um, and he, he stays loyal to the Confederacy until he dies. Um, so many people in the North call him a traitor. The former president of the United States joins a rebellion against that very government that he had led. So many people still call Tyler a traitor. Um, but as the new country's capital was Richmond, he traveled there to take his seat um, when the new government was meeting. But on January 18th, 1862, he dies shortly before the body's first session. So he is elected to the Confederate Congress, but he never serves in it. Uh, so thus later, he is buried in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, um, which is, this is actually, Hollywood Cemetery is also the final resting place of President James Monroe, who was reinterred there, and Confederate President Jefferson Davies, interestingly. So if you visit, uh, uh, Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, you can, um, you can see three, um, three different presidents, if you think about it. I mean, I wouldn't really call Jefferson Davies a president, but he was the president of the Confederacy. Um, so if you go to Rick Hollywood Cemetery, you can three, see these three uh, kind of important figures, whether you like, like them or not, of course. Jefferson Davies, very controversial figure. Um, obviously as president of the Confederacy, Tyler being a uh, loyal to the Confederacy himself. But anyway, that's gonna bring us to the end of this video. Um, that's uh, detailing the life of John Tyler as best that I could tell you in completion. Next, we're gonna move on to John Tyler's successor, James Knox Polk. So you can look forward to that. Thanks for watching.